Hello and welcome to this edition of Let's Talk About It with my guest today, Pastor Sterling Davis. Welcome to the show, Pastor Davis. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate absolutely, it. absolutely. You know, um, I heard about you through a friend of mine. Okay. Who, yeah, yeah, who has given you a lot of accolades and said, I'd like to see this guy on the show. Wow. Hence your presence here today. Well, whoever that anonymous person is, uh, we'll, we'll thank him later. We'll thank that person. <laughs> thank <him later. laughs> now, you've been a pastor for how many years? Wow. Uh, pastoral ministry has been about now, inclusive now, it's about, about 15 years. About 15 years. Now, I know that you're not originally from Houston, Texas. No, I'm not. I'm not. Can't you tell by the accent? I'm not. You're not? <laughs> <laughs> from the East it's Coast. Was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut. Yes, exactly, sir. exactly. Yes, okay, okay. Yes, uh, but you've now planted a church here in the city of Houston. Yes, yes. Um, pastor now of the greatest church on this side of heaven, the Renaissance Church of Houston. Um, we opened in October of last year, actually, with our very first Bible study last year, October uh, 4th, actually. October 4, 2012, and then okay. as of May 19th, 2013, we did our very first Sunday service, and so we've been kind of going strong since then. Is that right? Yes, sir. That yes, is sir. fantastic. Yes, now, tell me this. Now, I've heard of many pastors. I hear some say that they're called mm -hmm. uh, to be a minister, and then there's others that, that you know, I just kind of wonder about. <laughs> now, yeah, and, and, yeah. I, and I wanted to, now, you are a minister. How, how did you come to the place in your life where you said, I'm going to be a minister, or did God call you to be a minister? Wow, um, the story is pretty pretty interesting. Um, a lot of preachers have associated their life with call, um, and I think that's a general term. Okay. Um, I don't know if call is the right word. I always use the term purpose. Um, when I was a kid, um, I grew up in a Baptist church, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, and my godfather um, was uh, Dr. James B. Morrison, and gave me a chance, this was like 1975-ish, uh, gave me a chance to pray over the offering and all that fun stuff. And when I got a chance to do that, immediately I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Okay. I knew it. Um, and then watching him preach, sitting on his feet for, for years, just watching him study, watching him pray as my godfather being at the house, mm -hmm. um, watching him do what he does, said, this is what I want to do. Okay. Um, so I don't know um, if I always use the term call. I think the word call, actually, when you look at it in the Bible, um, it does not talk about um, this outspoken thing that comes out of heaven mm -hmm. it is so much that this is um, your predestined path and you just found your exit ramp to start doing what God has quote unquote called you to do so um, from there um, I didn't you know most preachers have that 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 soliloquy I ran because I didn't want to do this right, right. Um, no I didn't have that um, I couldn't wait okay. <laughs> I couldn't right. wait right. Um, because I just felt those this is what I'm born to do mm -hmm. um, and I think if you took this away from me Calls, you cannot answer calls. If I called you on your cell phone right now, you don't have to answer. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's call, but I think it's purpose. That's something I just can't, I, I go to sleep with it, I wake up with it. Um, no matter how much I try not to do it, I can't right. do it. Even when I didn't mm -hmm. want to do it, I found myself wanting to do it. Okay. Um, so I don't think that call is an accurate word, especially the way that we've thrown it around in church. Right. I think it's more so purpose. This is what I was born to do. It, that, that appears to me to be a passion yeah. as well. It's so not life. only is it a purpose, but it's passion. It's my life. It's your life. It's and you know what? I feel that coming from you. Oh, man. I feel the purpose. I feel the passion. And we want people to feel that when we're sitting on God's platform, giving them a word that could change their life. Well, I, I say this. Um, God is in the business of, of what I call reciprocity. <clears throat> um, whenever he gets ready to do anything, he never asks us, number one, to do anything that he hasn't already done. But at the same time, whatever he asks us to do, he's done it first. So um, he loves us. He doesn't. We don't love him. He loves us first. Mm -hmm. Then we're able to know what love is. So for us to even preach a word, he has to be the word for our life. Mm -hmm. And when he's the word for our life, then now I'm not just preaching to people. I'm literally sharing with them life that was given to me first. Right. And that's what preaching is. Yeah. And you know what? That type of style... As, as one might call it, will draw people. Wow. That's the hope. That's the hope. But, you know, and we're living in a different time. Um, I say this to my church all the time. We're living in a different time now where, number one, the church has lost some credibility. Yes. Um, leaders have lost some credibility. 
And so people, and I had the same mantra, I have no problems with saying this, I had the same mantra, um, that I love God, but I, I, I couldn't stand church. Mm -hmm. Love God, hate church. Um, and Lord convicted me in the middle of it and said, how can you hate that which I love? Mm -hmm. And so the passion then drove me as a pastor now to turn uh, the church around to the place we bring integrity back to the text or integrity back to the word of God. In other words, we're not using it to manipulate people to give us more money to build us bigger buildings, mm -hmm. but we're using it now to make sure that people live what I call accurate lives. I'm in the middle of a series now in our church called called accurate uh, called accuracy. Okay. And um, the word sin, we talk about sin in the church. Nobody talks about sin anymore in the church. But when we talk about <laughs> sin in the church, um, the word sin actually is a Greek word called hermatano, which means to miss the mark, which okay. means I'm actually aiming at something, but I miss it. But if I'm living accurately, which means I'm doing this on purpose, I don't want right. to miss. So we have to put people in a place where we have to let them understand um, that my life is not the sum total of scattered shooting. I want to live this. I have to okay. live this. You have direction, in other words. Yeah. And you know, a lot of times when you talk about sin, mm -hmm. and we talk about sin and the church, and you said that we don't oftentimes talk about sin in the church, exactly. uh, it tends to be something that's avoided. I think... This is my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes certain things are avoided in the church because the head is not always living the life that they should as the head. My, my, my. Well, <laughs> let, let me say this. Um, the old school, old school rule of thumb is church history has always taught us um, based on the life of Christ. Christ, um, as Paul puts it, he said that um, he was literally without sin literally without it he tempted at every point like we were mm -hmm. but was without sin now let's we have to look at that tempted like we were but was without sin so we figure now we preach now we stand in a place as under shepherds with an over shepherd being christ mm -hmm. that we have to appear a certain way um not understanding going back to your first word the word call if i had to use the word call let me use moses's life use moses life okay moses's life started with the fact that he was actually coming from a group of people who were enslaved. They, were, they weren't, quote unquote, fully impoverished, but they were people who were going through. They were oppressed, they were suppressed. But out of that, God pulls him out of that, mm -hmm. sticks him in Pharaoh's house, teaches him how to communicate with Pharaoh, like Pharaoh, has everything going for him, and then he still has an issue. He has an anger management problem. Now. Moses' anger management problem caught him on the job. He's out there tending, doing what he's got to do, second in command of all of Egypt, and all of a sudden his anger management hits, and he goes and he kills somebody, then he runs. Mm -hmm. When he runs, then he gets called on the backside of the mountain while he's tending his father-in-law's sheep. But notice later on in the text, the Bible says that that same anger management problem that he had before he got his call, okay. he still had that same anger with. management because he comes down from the mountain, he sees everybody going nuts, right? He just, they just lose it, they dance in, they're naked, they're just going crazy. Mm -hmm. That same thing rises up in him, and God says, speak to the rock, but it's, he's so mad that he strikes the rock. Mm. So the inference for us now is that even though I am the man of God, I still have an issue in my life that I have to deal with pre-call and post-call. That, that uh, thorn in the side. That's, That's what Paul calls it. And I think I like Paul's version of it because Paul never tells you what the thorn is. So in other words, there's some things <laughs> that are none of the folks' business. Okay. <laughs> just keep it to yourself. Yeah, just, yeah some things we just But just know that it's a thorn. But just know that I have one. Well, there you go. Just know that I have one. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think it's great when you're able to be transparent like that as a yeah. pastor and say, I too have a thorn in my side. Or I too have dealt with certain situations. So it... it it's important to me to hear what you're saying about your real life and about things that you have been through and or experienced in your life. Exactly. And you know what? We're going to be back in just a moment so that we can continue this great dialogue. Okay, we'll do that. All right, so All we're right. going to be back in just a moment. We'll be back with more of Let's Talk About It in just a few minutes, folks. Stick around. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Let's Talk About It where my guest today is none other than Pastor Sterling Davis of the, is it the Renaissance? Yep, the Renaissance Church. Of the Renaissance Church that you started over a year ago. Over a year ago. Yeah. yeah. Now, how did you come up with the name, the Renaissance? I'm just curious. Wow. Um, the name actually comes out, of course, the French name. It actually means the rebirth. Okay. Um, and so there are some things that the church has gotten away from 
uh, over the course of time. We've modernized the church so much so that we have, um, let me use a better term, we have forgotten God in church. We've learned mm. how to have God, how to have church without him. Um, so when the Lord spoke to myself, um, spoke to myself and my wife, we started looking at um, what it is that God wanted to do. He wanted to start a rebirthing of the church um, and bringing some things back to the church that we've left out for the sake of being, quote unquote, contemporary and modern, such as okay. the hymns of the church. Um, we strive to do hymns in our church. I is love right? them. Yes, okay. I love the hymns of the church. The word <laughs> hymn actually comes from the word hymen, um, which means it's a wedding song. So it's a song for from the bridegroom um, to the bride. And it's also inverted, inverted well. So there's some things that we sing in the church mm -hmm. um, that are great emotional songs. Right. But they're not songs that cause the bridegroom to look at us and say, you know what, I really love her mm -hmm. because she sees herself a certain way. So bringing hymns back into the church. Okay. Um, certain attire, like again, I'm, I'm in clerical <clears throat> attire now, but there are certain, there's a certain uniform of the priest of the church okay. that, ha that, we, that we got away from because we, want, we didn't want to look so stiff and so... You know, so regimented. Right. But but those are the things that we do. Those are the things that we teach. So he said, first of all, we're going to do that. Rebirth, bring, bring a rebirthing to that. Number two was the rebirthing of reverence for God. Mm -hmm. Where we don't just come into church, say what we want to say, do what we want to do, live any kind of way. Um, because, you know, most of us know, especially in the you know, contemporary church, you know, you can pretty much say what you want to say uh, in the church, in the sanctuary. Um, so we've kind of, we're kind of saying, no, this is the place where God lives. Right. This is the place where God wants to use it. So let's bring a reverence back to God. Let's bring relationship back to the church where everybody's not so standoffish and so, um, let me use the term, um, he's a good term, um, so combative and competitive. Okay. So now it's not about me trying to outdo you. It's because we actually sit in the same area that I get a chance to share your life as opposed to competing with you. Okay. So those are the kind of things no, that we want to have a rebirth. And when you talk about competing, give me an example of what that might be in the, in the body of a church. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think that we compete about, let me just talk church. Yeah. Um, size of church. Let's mm -hmm. talk size. Um, he has five members. He has 5,000 members. And so the guy with five doesn't feel adequate uh, because he has his five, because the guy at 5,000 is looking at him any different. Um, I say this often, and I mean no disrespect to anybody that's got 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. Um, sometimes, the, let me say this, the Bible says that broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way. Mm. So sometimes you might gather the crowd, <coughs> mm -hmm. and it might be a whole bunch of them, but they might be missing God because they're just there to get lost in the crowd. Mm -hmm. But then you have some smaller churches that... They don't care about the crowd. They're just trying to get to God. Mm. Let me use a scripture so that way I try to be as biblically sound as I can. There was a woman, there was a young man um, who, was who was actually lame. That he had some brothers that carried him. I think you know the story. They carried him uh, on a pallet. And what the Bible says is that there was a small house that was really crowded with a whole bunch of people. Okay. And this man was part of the same community. They knew that he was sick. But they brought him to the house. None of the crowd let this man in. None of them let him mm. in. They had to, now, his friends were so adamant about him seeing Jesus that they cut a hole in the roof to let him down. That means that sometimes the crowds only want what Jesus has. They don't want him. And mm. so sometimes people show up to church to get God's stuff, but they don't want him. So you got to be careful about wow. crowds. You got to be careful about, not to say that I'm, I'm mad at people that have 20,000, 50,000. I'm going to get there one day myself. But the issue is, Mega is not about capacity, I mean about how many members you have sometimes. It's about how much can how much of God can these people actually hold in their life. And you know what? That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. So yeah. now for myself, seeing a lot of large churches or mega churches, oftentimes, and I'm just being transparent and being honest, mm -hmm. oftentimes I have wondered myself, is there any type of greed involved when I see various churches with multiple locations um, all over and around the world. Now, I, I don't know if God has spoken to that person mm -hmm. to say, plant a seed here, plant a seed there, plant mm -hmm. a seed in Timbuktu, plant a seed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there are times for myself that I have sit back and wondered, why are all these churches being planted by a pastor? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, and, and now if, if God has ordained that and if God has mm -hmm. spoken to that person and said, plant, a, plant, you know, then I don't know that. <laughs> you know, I'm just sitting here myself right. looking in, right. if that makes any sense, right. uh, as a spectator. Mm -hmm. um, so there's times that I wonder, and I wonder if there is sometimes competition, mm -hmm. ministerially speaking, that exists in the body of Christ, that, mm -hmm. that really should not exist if your focus is God. But sometimes I think that, like you said a moment ago, the mega churches, and I'm not saying anything wrong with the mega churches, let me make that clear. But there are times that I have wondered if certain pastors might be in competition with one another um, to say, okay, I got 20,000 members and, you know, and I got, a, 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 you know, various ways to tr transport myself from one part of the city to the other that may not be in a car. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there's just times that I just have, I question certain <laughs> things. <laughs> I'm just being honest and I'm just being real because that's the only way that I know how to be. Um, and, and I like to talk about these things because I think that it helps other people to have a better understanding when I speak to a man of God who is knowledgeable about Christ and Christ's purpose here on earth let for me, his let me, people. I'll say this, and um, there, there are a couple things that we, because the paradigm is so big, it's, it's, it's vast, and so I'm going to try to squeeze it all in. One is, I believe that multiple location churches, I believe that that's God. I'm going to tell you why. And I'm not saying everybody that's doing it is God. I'm saying I believe the paradigm for it is okay. God. Um, you have Paul, who if you look at every, if you look at more than 60% of what we call the New Testament was written by Paul. And Paul is literally a pastor of multiple locations. Um, Corinth is one of his locations. Okay. Okay. So he writes to Corinth couple times. I read two actual letters that are written to Corinth. Um, you have Ephesus. That's another location. Um, he writes to his pastor um, that's in Ephesus. Timothy, when he writes to Tim. When he writes to Timothy, he's writing because Timothy is actually 20 some odd years old uh, as a pastor in the Ephesians church. Okay. So when you look at this, this paradigm of multiple locations, it is very biblical. Um, that's what the word apostle means. It means that this is a person who is sent out to be what's called uh, in canon law the establishmentarian. This is a guy who goes to establish these churches, okay. get the doctrine set, get the people set, get their focus squared away. And then after he does that, he might pastor there for a little bit, but then what he does is he establishes one of their own, puts them in there. A shepherd okay. or the word pastor comes from the same word you get the word pasture from, which means that if I'm going to pastor these people, I have to come from the same pasture that they're from. Mm. Okay. okay. So he didn't go and get a, a, a guy from from Ephesus to pastor the Corinthian church didn't do it. Um, he didn't go get a guy from Corinth to do the Ephesian church. Okay. He got a guy from from the Ephesus church that lived right there in Ephesus. Said, Tim, you come from among these people. You go ahead and do this. So I think that there is a paradigm for it, and it's very biblical. Okay. Um, it also starts. We can always we can always go back to the Great Commission again. It is the making of disciples. Mm -hmm. You know, we take these twelve guys. And these 12 guys are going to go establish these locations out here in my name. Okay? So I don't think that that's the... I think that it's a biblical mandate. I think what happens is, is that we have become so westernized in our thinking in church um, and so capitalistic at some particular points where now it becomes multiple locations now are not about church. It's about franchising the brand. And so some guys do it because that's what God said. Outstanding. <clears throat> Some guys do it because it's another way to franchise the, you know, franchise the brand, which, again, extends their influence for whatever their reasons are. The issue for us becomes, as a church, is to make sure that we maintain the standard of what God has commissioned us to do in these locations. It can't just be about the money. It can't be about um, the way I'm transported to and fro. It has to be about the exactness of what God has called us to do in these communities. Mm -hmm. If I'm called, right now I'm on the northwest side of Houston. If he tells me to go and do something in Third Ward, then guess what? I got to go to Third Ward first to understand what's going on there. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, let me use another word. I have to do, um, I have to know what the demographics are. I can't minister to what I don't understand. It has and, to be relatable. And right. The people that you're talking to have to be relatable. And I don't know. And I don't know them. So it's not just about going down and saying, we're going to put a location here. Mm -hmm. Because 
this is not the church is not Kentucky Fried Chicken. We just don't put something there because there's land there. Right. <laughs> we know we don't put something there because people like chicken. Mm -hmm. You know, we put it there because there has to be a mandate for what we do outside of our preaching, outside of our teaching. There has to be something about what we are doing as ministry mm -hmm. that these people can benefit from to make the quality of their life and their lifestyle better. Very important. And uh, which leads me to this question. Do you feel like Community is the the church is failing the community. Woo! And let me tell you why I asked that question, uh, because I see. Man, I feel like Jackie Robinson right now. <clears throat> is that right? Is that right? Yeah, I'm probably the first one on the show to get the yellow stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I like your humor. And, I, and, and as a matter of fact, in reading your information, I see humor is one of the things that you like to yeah, pray bring for. Yeah, issues. Bring okay. it to the church. <laughs> but it's a good thing because we all like, to, and that's something that's universal. Laughing and humor is certainly universal, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> it's certainly universal. <laughs> so I appreciate the laughter even at this time. <laughs> now we were we were talking about uh, the 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 community and the church family community. And, and what I was about to say is that I see so many churches in neighborhoods. It's like the, the neighborhoods are inundated with with uh, with churches. But then I look at the community and I don't see the evidence of church being in the community. You know what? I I have to stop at this point. We're going to be back in just a moment with more. Let's talk about it as we continue this dialogue with the wonderful pastor, Sterling Davis. We'll be back in just a second. All right. Welcome back to Let's Talk About It with my awesome guest today. Yes, I said awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, none other than Pastor Sterling Davis. Man, welcome back to the show. Man, thank you. Thank you. It has really been a pleasure exchanging dialogue with you. And, and not only exchanging dialogue, but getting a better understanding of the word oh, man. Thank you. Uh, from you today. Now, when we left off, we were talking about the church, of course. And my question to you was, is the church failing the community? I, I think on a large scale, um, let, me, let me use the megachurch paradigm first. Okay. I think that when people hit the megachurch paradigm, they hit it so badly um, because of their size, because of what the pastor drives, what he wears. But there are a lot of megachurches that are doing some great things in communities because they have the money and the resources to do those. Um, from food pantries, um, clothing, uh, even some of them have gone as far as to do, to build what's called a CDC, uh, Community Development Corporation. Right. So uh, some of them are building senior housing, uh, low income housing, and they're doing a great job mm -hmm. and also doing some financial literacy stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think on a large scale, the, the megachurch gets hit because of the preacher, but don't, but don't, but they don't know what programs are happening as well. Mm -hmm. um, on a, that's on a large scale. Right. I think on the smaller scale, when you have a church that's either just starting or what have you, some of them might start for the wrong reasons. Some of them might start um, so that you know the last preacher didn't get a chance to preach so much at his church, so now he's going to leave and he's going to start his own church. Mm -hmm. um, and so we go back to the community now and say the first duty of the church beyond its preaching and its teaching is to infect and affect the community in which it sits. Mm -hmm. um, um, the Bible says it best in Acts. When at, we read Acts and we say, you know, um, you know, Jesus gets ready at the day of Pentecost and he says, you know, listen, um, stay here in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Ghost. And when he comes, um, you know, he's going to come in and you're going you're gonna to become witnesses. And then you're going to be witnesses first mm -hmm. in your community second to the other parts of the community, then the state, then the nation, then the world. Okay. So in other words, you cannot tell me that you're a church that's infused with the Holy Ghost and Judea is still being hit. Now explain that. Okay. In, in the text in Acts, is actually, actually Acts 1 and 8, when we talk about receiving the Holy Ghost, the first place that God causes us um, to have influence in. The word influence comes from the same word English where we get the word influenza from. Okay. So he says, the church is supposed to have the Holy Ghost, and when we receive the Holy Ghost, we become a virus in our community. Okay. So they can receive everything that we're receiving. Gotcha. They okay. receive not just the information, they also receive the impartation as well. Okay. So now, they're not just running around, let me use it because you know I'm, I'm clearly Pentecostal, so okay. really not just running around speaking in tongues, <laughs> jumping all over the building. It is so much that now what we're saying, people are starting to want to live. They're starting to live better. Um, circa 1940s, uh, when the war broke out, mm -hmm. um, the history of the church was that, the, that corporate America wouldn't hire anybody except Christians because they knew 
that Christians would come in, be to work on time. They would come in and they would work hard. They wouldn't cause a whole lot of confusion because they knew, because one of the part, parts of the application asked, what church do you belong to? Okay. Who was your pastor? Mm. Because the church had such an influence on the community that people mm. got hired out of the community because of the church. Right. Okay. So that's what it's about. So we have to be, and I don't think that we failed. I think we have to do a better job. Okay. We have to do a, we have to do a, a better, better job. We have to get into the school again. Um, and we have to get to a place, I'm going to say something, shut up. Um, we have to get to a place where we are no longer reactive. We not, that's what happens to us. We get hit when we, something happens, we react. Instead of us being proactive, they couldn't have took prayer out of schools if we were in school. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. couldn't have done certain things. Teachers can't say certain things and act certain ways if we go to city council meetings. So you say, just the church, we're not supposed to be in power. There's separation between church and state. There's only a legal separation of church and state, but there's a mandate for us to bring the church or to bring the church to the state. You've got to do that. Right. Well, we're getting all kind of revelations here today and, uh, and, and new understandings, you know, that make a difference. And, you know, and when we have education about something, we are empowered by it. Sure. So, and, you know, with the knowledge that you're, I'm going to use the term that the young folks are spitting, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, people are getting a, a new understanding. Now, I want to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, and I'm full of questions, needless to say. Uh, when it comes to tithing. Oh, God, oh, God. Okay. Now, and, 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 and you can answer it however you elect to answer it. Uh, if you have someone, a, a member in your church that is uh, a non-tither, mm -hmm. but, uh, and it may be because they just lack, they just don't have. It mm -hmm. could possibly be that they just don't have. But if they came to the church with a need for a light bill to be paid or for uh, a car note to be t paid or food to be on would your church help those people out? Yeah. Uh, tithing is not the prerequisite for, let me, let me say this, the, the, the tithing is not a prerequisite for a loan from the church. Um, you know, that's not what we're supposed to do. Now, Malachi does say this. Malachi does say, bring all the tithes to the storehouse so they may be meat in my house. Now, when that text was actually written, that text was written because there was a place of famine and they were trying to say, let's make sure that we do what we have to do so when we get back to this place, there's something that everybody can come and get from. Mm. Now, not just the tither, but that's when it says meat. The word meat there doesn't just mean, it means substance. Mm -hmm. So that means that anybody that needs, we can supply. That's why it's called the storehouse. Because some people might not be able to, but it's not our job to weed out the haves and haves nots. It's not our job. Mm -hmm. It is our job to supply for those. That's why the text, that's why Jesus makes it real clear. You take care of the poor. You take care of the orphans. You take care of the widows. That is the ministry of the church. He said, now, if you do if you do this for them, whatever you do to the least of these, mm -hmm. you've done this unto me. Right. So that should be the prerequisite now for who we help. We help the least of these mm -hmm. because if we don't do that, then the question becomes, how does God receive us at that particular point or what have we done to him? There you go. And I like that answer. That's a very good answer. And the reason why I asked that question, and I need to say the reason why I am asking that question, is because I've actually uh, heard of uh, congregations that actually uh, will not help members that are not tithers. Now, I want to ask you this question. <clears throat> and they keep very strong financial records of the parishioners. To, to know that you're tithing or not tithing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just being honest, just being real. Um, now, is tithing always something Cherry, that's done in a way, or is tithing the time that one might put into church, or to sit and babysit or keep the kids in the church, mm -hmm. or to, to be the armor bearer, or to define how you see tithes according to the word. The, the, word, the word defines tithing as the 10% of the first fruits of all of your increase. That's how it's so then, So then but would, that would be then monetary? That would be my money. Okay. Okay. Where your treasure is, where your money is, that's where your heart is. Mm -hmm. So the issue for us starts with money. Now, I have to, if I give God, now tithing, this, this will probably help out a lot of people. We live in the church, we use the term kingdom. 
That is, that is the paradigm that we use. Mm -hmm. Every kingdom has a king. Christ is our king. Okay. And in every kingdom, there's a tax in the kingdom to make sure that everybody, according to, I believe it's Acts 2, that everyone has all things in common. That's what Acts 2 says. Okay. They have all things in common. So in order for us to have all things in common, as we pay our tax to the king, the king then has to disperse the tax money to make sure that everybody has all things in common. Okay. Okay. So I pay my tithes to the king. Now let's now spiritualize it. Or bi uh, me, me use the term biblical process. Okay. Biblical process now says that as I pay my 10% to the king, he makes sure that I have all things in common. David says it best. I, I, was once your, um, I was once young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, forsaken mm -hmm. nor his seed mm -hmm. begging bread. Why is that? Because when I pay my tithe into the king, the king puts it in the storehouse. When I go into a place of lack, then he looks at how the kingdom is being managed, and he says, if everybody has meat on their table, if everybody has da 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 I cannot let them go lacking. I got to make sure. So what is it that you need? I need blah, blah, blah. He goes to the storehouse. He goes, grabs it, so that now we can have all things in common. Mm -hmm. That's the principle behind tithing. Now, if I don't make any money, let's say I'm not making any money whatsoever, then there's what I call the at t rule. Attendance, time, and tithe. If I don't have the money, mm -hmm. then at least let me give my time. Mm -hmm. Let me give my attendance. Let me and show that's up and do. Yeah. That's reasonable. Now, as I do that, then God, I believe, this is just Sterlinian theology. Mm -hmm. I just believe then that as I sow my time, mm -hmm. then God stores my time up. And he says, because you've been faithful over this, mm -hmm. I believe you're ready to, to move over here. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we are lacking employment because we're not managers over our time well. Mm -hmm. So then he puts in a place where we have to manage our time well for free before mm -hmm. he can trust us with substance. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> you know what? You all right? You all right? You 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 up there? You 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 way up there? Man, I I no. got I got to give it to you. you I'm are, just a regular. You are, I I am I am uh, thoroughly um. I guess impressed might be a good word. Oh man, nah. I, I ain't trying to give you too much credit, but nah. I no. just hope I'm leaving an impression. I leave no, an but impression. I, I'm good. And, and you have left an impression, absolutely. And uh, I certainly appreciate your level of understanding when it comes to the Bible. Uh, and when it comes to spirituality and things of that nature, you, you have really um, made a difference here today. Grateful. Yeah. Thank you too. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm very glad for that. Very glad for that. Now, it's interesting because you have a background uh, as a Marine. Yeah. And you are, <laughs> so, so you are. So, so you, <laughs> yes, sir. You, yes, are, sir. you are at war in, in many ways. Yes, sir. Um, it, it was uh, the Marine Corps. I went straight out of high school into Marines. Is that right? Okay. Um, needed to. Um, it needed to because at that particular point, I wasn't mature enough as a man. I think if I would have went to college or done anything at that particular point, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Gotcha. So God literally orchestrated my steps to go into the Marines. Um, I found I found my I would say this, I, I grew up, I matured okay. sure in Marines. Um, and then even as the baby of my family, mm -hmm. um, I grew up there. But then um, I think without going there, I wouldn't understand who Jesus is. I got saved in Japan. Oh, While wow. I was in Japan, uh, that's when I received Christ uh, for real. For real. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> for real. Um, okay. And then my call of ministry actually came um, during my time in Japan. I preached my first sermon actually in Japan. And between Japan, Korea... And um, yeah, between Japan and Korea, was my wow. first time preaching. Then I came home and preached. Is that right? Yeah. Wow, that's awesome, man. Well, you know what? I just want to encourage you to continue to do what you're doing, and I want to encourage you to continue to influence the people that you are, that God has blessed you to influence, and uh, certainly that that those people that are influenced by you go out and spread the word about you, that you may continue to grow and prosper in what God's plan is for your life. I have thoroughly enjoyed my dialogue with Pastor Sterling Davis on this day, and I know you guys have certainly been informed about so much as it relates to the Bible. I have so many questions as it relates to the Bible, and uh, pastor, spirituality, and all this thing, all these types of things. And, uh, and I know that other people do too. And so I like to ask those questions that I think will matter and make a difference in the lives of others when they get the opportunity 
to witness. All right, Christ welcome back to this edition of Let's Talk About It with my guest today, none other than Pastor Sterling Davis. You know, one of the things that I want to talk about, you've written a book. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, long time coming. Long time coming. The Overseer. Yes. Yes. Um, now, with that title, I, I just have to ask you, how did you come up with that title, The Overseer? Um, good question. Um, it's long, but I'll make it short. <laughs> um, um, I'm a consecrated overseer okay. um, in, in, in the church, and um, one of the things that um, I'm asked, I'm part of the Joint College of African American Pentecostal Bishops. Um, in the college, we meet every year uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, in March. Okay. And this is where um, bishops from across the country, let alone across the world, actually come to be trained on how to be bishops. Okay. And so um, our president bishop, also our founder, is Archbishop J. Delano Ellis II. And so one of the things that we get a chance to do there is that the bishops have a class. There's a class for overseers, and then there's a class now for pastors and a class for adjutants, so, and also a class for first ladies, and there's a class there um, for administrators and for liturgy. Now, with all of that, uh, one year I've gone, I've gone for at least seven, ten years now, mm -hmm. and we have a class for overseers, and a lot of the overseers have asked, you know, what is our role, what are we supposed to do uh, in our different communions and our different fellowships and, and, and reformations, what, what is our role, why mm -hmm. do we do what we do, and so out of all of these questions, um, <coughs> the Lord pretty much put on my heart okay. to write this book. And as I wrote the book, I got a chance to get into some of the church history. Anybody knows I'm a church history nut. Um, and also part of the liturgy of why we do what we do as overseers for our bishops. Um, so in the book, we define our role biblically. Okay. We talk about where our biblical role came from, where our ties came from historically, which means that we talk about the Catholic Church. Okay. We talk about the days prior to the Catholic Church. A lot of people say, you're wearing this outfit right here. You look like you're part of the Catholic Church. Right. I think the collar right, tends, the to collar, right. tends itself. And right. we talk about that in this book because the, the issue is that this attire is called civic attire, tonsorial attire, um, clerical attire. This is older than the Catholic Church. And a lot of people don't know that. They're like, no, it's the Catholic Church. No, this is older than the Catholic Church. It's part okay. of the Orthodox Church. And so, for instance, in the book, we talk about the collar that we wear. People call it the collar, mm -hmm. but it's actually called a yoke. Okay. In the old days, what happened is, short, short history, in the old days, what happened is that any of the uh, priests or even bishops of the church, of course, they were killed and persecuted by Romans. And so what happened is, is that they would go ahead, the, the lions would get at them and kill them, they would do all this kind of torture. They would stand them up into the middle of the Colosseum, they were wearing a white robe that had a white collar on it, like this. Okay. And what they would do is stand up in the middle of the Colosseum and, and literally announce that these are people who are following Christ, blah, 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 mm. and they would call an execution to cut them off at the head right where the collar started. So this is not a collar for us, it's a yoke, and it says that we're willing to put our neck on the line for the cause of Christ. Wow. That's why we wear this. So we talk about those kind of things in the book. Yeah. We talk about those kind of things in the book and also okay. uh, lead a roadmap for the overseers to actually be good at their job, to protect their fellowship, to protect their communions, and at the same time uh, to protect what we consider orthodoxy that leads to orthoplexy. Orthoplexy meaning right practice as a result of right belief. Wow. Well, <laughs> with all of that being said, as you all know, the platform for the show is to educate, we are certainly getting educated, <laughs> motivate, and inspire. Yes, sir. And uh, you've done all those things, man. You have covered the bases. You done motivated, because I'm motivated certainly now to read this book. <laughs> I've been educated, and I've been inspired. Grateful. Your job has certainly been done. Thanks so much for your time here on Let's Talk About It Today. Again, I, I'm almost speechless, which is rare. <laughs> All right. Great. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, Pastor Davis as much as I did. For more information on Let's Talk About It, you can certainly give us a call. Or not actually give us a call, but our email address is let's talk about it 12 tv at gmail.com. That's let's talk about it 12 tv at gmail.com. And for more information on Pastor Davis, Sure. Uh, for more information, of course, if you want to visit us at the Renaissance Church, you can. It's 5829 West Ham Houston Parkway North, building number 10. Uh, we start, uh, our Bible study is actually called I Study, which means interactive study. Okay. Um, on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. If you can, we'd love to have you join us on live stream. We get a chance to interact with you, answer your questions live while we're there. And, of course, on Sundays, we start at 3 p.m. 
Um, you can also look at look us up on Facebook. I'm also on okay. Facebook, uh, C. Sterling Davis uh, on Facebook, and also the Renaissance Church at Facebook. If you want to order the book, The Overseer, of course, you can go to Amazon.com, find it there, uh, or else you can look for our Facebook page, um, The Renaissance Writing. That's our publishing house attached to our church. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So The Renaissance Writings, you can order the book from there as well. And again, uh, it's been a great time, man. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Hey, you know what? I feel the same. And uh, this copy is mine, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to sign it after the show. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Pastor. All right. Thank Until you. next time, we'll see you guys then. Thank you.